In the remote depths of Siberia, these brilliant minds unearthed a meteorite that had crash-landed in the vast expanse of space. But what they found inside this celestial visitor was nothing short of mind-boggling. Hello everyone. In this video, we will unravel the mysteries of this extraordinary discovery and explore the implications it holds for our understanding of the universe. But before we start, make sure to subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon for regular updates. Let's get started. In the early 1980s, Israeli physicist Daniel Shechtman worked at Maryland's National Institute of Standards and Technology. He found a new crystal pattern in a manganese aluminum alloy. Shechtman recognized a pattern unlike triangular or cuboid crystal structures. Iowa State University materials scientist Pat Thiel demonstrated pseudo-crystalline properties by tiling tiles. According to PBS, bathroom floor tiles might be rectangles, triangles, squares, or hexagons. Danny Shechtman found that pentagonal symmetry works, but unlike triangles or squares, pentagons don't fit together nicely. Some experts questioned Schechtman's discoveries because they couldn't imagine that crystal structures could be entirely flipped. In 2011, the Gaithersburg National Institute director urged Schechtman to leave. Schechtman remembered that I fought the world for a long time. The two-time Nobel laureate Linus Pauling, the idol of the American Chemical Society and one of the world's most recognized chemists, led the opposition to my discoveries. In the Iowa State release, Schechtman explained that Pauling fought quasi-periodicity crystals for years until his death. The 2011 Reuter story described Pauling as claiming there are no quasi-crystals, only quasi-scientists. Schechtman's quasi-crystal prediction merited his 2011 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Non-stick pans, lead lights, and surgical equipment benefit from quasi-crystals. Professor Basam Chikashiri of the University of Wisconsin-Madison told PBS that quasi-crystal's potential as a material will only be realized in the future, but his early groundbreaking work was on man-made samples, and it was widely believed that quasi-crystals were too volatile for natural formation. Steinhardt and Bindi's Florence's Natural History Caterpillar studied disproved this. Since 1999, the museum Steinhardt has sought natural quasi-crystals. He found the Florence Catterkite sample 10 years later and established that it had spontaneously generated quasi-crystals. Steinhardt subsequently transported a chunk of the Florence Catterkite to the California Institute of Technology, where scientists identified oxygen isotopes, confirming that it was a meteorite and that the quasi-crystals originated over 4 billion years ago. So around the time our sun was coming into being, now that Steinhardt could be certain of the extraterrestrial origin of his quasi-crystals, he realized that he needed to find more of this material. But where had the Florence Museum sample of catasite come from? Speaking to Quanta magazine in 2014, Steinhardt said we had to discover how the rock managed to get to the museum. All we had was a box, and that brings us back to why Steinhardt had to turn detective. The caterpillar's genesis was his task. The theoretical physicists found a letter in the Florence Natural History Museum's records that claimed the box containing the catasite sample came from Amsterdam, which was sold to the museum by Nicholas Kokik, a collector. Unfortunately, the museum's records didn't have this Koch's usual name. When the dinner guest returned to Amsterdam, she asked her neighbor Mrs. Kokik if she knew a collector with the same surname, who was Nicholas Kokik, the washer's late husband. Bindi booked a Florence Amsterdam flight after hearing this. Mrs. Kokik gave Bindi access to her late husband's documents. Quanta magazine found this promising but unfruitful. We spent six weeks trying to find Tim and didn't get even a smidgen of a hint. She revealed that her husband used to keep a secret diary, and this item was to prove more informative. The secret diary showed that Coca-Cola, in fact, bought the sample of Catterkite from one Leonard Dress. Steinhardt said, Rayson, who discovered Catterkite in the 1980s, was known to Bindi. Kokik sold the Catterkite to the Florence Museum. Steinhardt researched Rayson after witnessing a similar mineral at a St. Petersburg attraction. The sample was found in Siberia's second-largest mountain range, 
the Koryak Mountains, but Raisin couldn't pinpoint its position. Steinhardt reviewed Raisin's 1985 Ketikite report to keep going. Steinhardt discovered Dooley when Kryakshko co-wrote the 1995 report. Suddenly, we went from nothing to maybe this is our guy, Steinhardt said of finding Kryashko's name. The scientist found Kryashko, now in his 60s, in Moscow and was able to translate for him. Razin had hired Kryashko as a graduate student to look for platinum in the late 1970s. While there was no sign of the precious metal, the student did come across some strange metallic lumps back in civilization. Kryashko then handed the curious substance to Razin, and that was the last he had known of them until Steinhardt and Bindi had contacted him all those years later. But there was good news. Kryachko could pinpoint the exact place where he'd found the Katerkite. This part of Siberia was so far east as it turned out, as Hollist had said. Indeed, Steinhardt recalled that most geologists would agree that the chances of finding anything going back were tiny, and it was probably a wild goose chase, but the only way you had a chance was to go with Valery Kryashko, which they did in 2011 with a 13-strong group that included him and Diane. Kryashko visited during the summer thaw. Two snowcats from Amater took four days to reach the list Benetavi stream. They set up a temporary lab to test samples and dug through the blue-green clay. Machine gunners protected the team from bears during excavation. Luckily, Bindi found a meteorite fragment in the mud on the first day. After a week, the scientists collected a few pounds of promising samples from 1.5 tons of clay and went home. The next day, we go over the mountains and see that they are completely snowy. However, Hollister and others at Princeton analyzed the materials, which may have encouraged researchers. They brought back at least nine meteorite fragments with rare copper aluminum alloys and quasi-crystals. Hollister and others spent two additional years investigating the Katerkite's matter mix and developing a theory for its creation. Researchers think a big asteroid's impact formed the quasi-crystals and other minerals. Unknown mechanisms in the solar nebula generated the caterpillar's rare substance. The cloud of space dust and debris that formed our sun and ultimately the planets, we know another possibility is that the more unusual constituents of the material, including the quasi-crystals, could have been created by the force of asteroids coming together in a violent manner. But scientists are happy to admit that they still have much to learn about how natural quasi-crystals formed. As Steinhardt told Weiss in 2016, it is very early in the time for these. That's it for today. What do you think about this incredible discovery? Let us know in the comments section. Please like and share our videos. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon for regular updates.